good to command attention like this. <laughs> it is a perfect day to be civil. Civil. Kind. Polite. Respectful. Cultured. I'm greeting you on this morning. I am W. Franklin Evans, Vice President for Innovation here at Allen University and Director of the Boeing Institute on Civility. So let me be the first to say welcome to the Boeing Center, the Boeing Studio, and to this aspect of the Boeing Institute on Civility. So delighted that you've chosen to join us on today for our spring symposium. The symposium that focuses on civility and social justice. Here at Allen University, founded in 1870, we have a rich, rich history. We continue to do amazing things, not only here locally, throughout the state, the region, but this nation. A part of what we do is we certainly change lives and make a difference in the lives of others. I am so pleased that we have someone at our helm who continues to achieve, who continues to make a difference. He is our 30th president of Allen University. He is a go-getter. He is an innovator, a strategist, and he is my boss. He is Dr. Ernest McNeely, and at this time, Dr. McNeely will come to welcome you and to greet you. Allen University 
and our Boeing Institute. And that person is none other than Ms. Sherry Carter. Ms. Carter is the Vice President of uh, Boeing Global Engagement. It is a, a position that she has held for over four years. She is someone who, uh, with Boeing, is responsible for the charitable contributions that Boeing makes to various organizations. Charitable contributions, and I'm so glad that Allen University is one of the charities that Boeing has chosen to partner with and to support. The good thing about uh, Ms. Carter is that she has been a foundation person for several organizations. I believe PBS, she was an executive director of its foundation. What I really like about her is that she is a Georgia peach. Uh, I'm a Georgian. She attended the University of Georgia, and, and so go dogs. I want to welcome uh, Ms. Carter to the lecture at this time to provide welcome comments and remarks on behalf of the Boeing Company, Ms. Sherry Carter. Older. I love to be a Georgia Peach. Wow, this has been a long time coming, and we've been looking forward to this day. For my whole experience at Boeing has been highlighted with this partnership with Allen University. It's just amazing. So thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, I'm really, I mean, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm almost giddy because um, this is really the inaugural event that we've been planning, we've been looking forward to, um, and we're just pleased to co-host this. Um, and we look forward to many other events like this along the way. I think this partnership is a lifetime, and we have to keep, keep doing more and more together. None of this would be possible without the partnership of several really important people. And uh, first and foremost, Dr. McNeely, thank you. Your guidance, your leadership has been really important along the way. And you were determined to get this done. And you got it done in a, in a look at this beautiful setting that we have today. It's just amazing. I mean, obviously, Dr. Dove Taylor, I don't know where you are, Dove, because it's hard to see with the lights, but I'm telling you, this man is, he, persistence is his middle name. <laughs> it's hard to say no to him. Um, and he has really developed this into a magnificent partnership. So, Dove, thank you. I know you're here somewhere, and we appreciate you. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Board of Trustees. I know that we He's here today, and also Bishop Green. Hopefully, we'll get to see him later in the day. Um, and also, Tommy Preston, thank you for getting up early, coming over here to be with us today. We appreciate it. He is, Tommy is our Vice President of Ethics and proud South Carolinian. When we think South Carolina and the Boeing Company, we think about Tommy. He really stands for everything it means to be a proud South Carolinian. He's going to moderate our panel. Um, we have two esteemed panelists today, dear friends of Boeing and partners. Stella Britton, she leads the Jackie Robinson Foundation. She's just a stunning, heartfelt individual who is a great leader in many, many ways. We're honored that you're here. Um, Dr. Russell Wigginton, thank you for coming up from Memphis. Um, Russ is the, he leads the National Civil Rights Museum, um, and he has, he's got great plans and aspirations, and he's making all those real as well for the National Civil Rights Museum, and we're happy to be a part of all that with you. We have other really important people here from South Carolina that are our friends and our partners, and we appreciate you all so much. Um, these institutions that are represented here today are so critical because they inspire conversations. And they really challenge us to take action to move us forward and the world forward. 
I think the Emmanuel 9 memorial that you saw when you walked into this space this morning is a really strong reminder of why those conversations matter. And it's a reminder of the lives lost and the lives that were permanently affected by hateful acts. We're challenged to think about the ways the world has changed so far and the ways we want to change it in the future. And we don't have to all agree in those conversations. Um, I'm sure that along the way, MLK, Jackie Robinson may not have agreed on the same issues, but they respect, you have to have that respect and build the trust to have these conversations like we're gonna have today. Boeing partnered with Allen University to create the Institute on Civility because we are committed to promoting civil discourse. We are committed to promoting constructive, open-minded, respectful conversations that are foundational to any progress we make as a society. Looking at Boeing's workforce, we have over 170,000 teammates globally, each with their own life experiences, their own opinions, but all of those internal thoughts and issues create and inform all of our perspectives. There's no way for 170,000 people to agree on every topic, and we don't have to. But we do have to work together because we have a big mission at Boeing to protect, connect, and explore our world and beyond. And it can't be done alone. Our diversity of backgrounds and experiences makes us better, and our shared focus on our mission brings us all together. I think the same thing can be said for everyone here. Our diversity makes us better, and a shared commitment to progress brings us all together. I do hope, and I'm going off script, I'm sorry, Lilla, but I do hope that the students here at Allen become our next generation of leaders and those that can really change the world. And I believe through experiences um, that you're creating, Dr. McNeely, with your board, with Doug, with Dr. Evans, that's exactly what you're gonna do. So thank you all for being here. We appreciate the partnership so much and we're very proud of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carter, for those kind words uh, and informative words as well. The Boeing Institute on Civility, we host a quarterly symposium. So this is our spring symposium. We look forward to having a summer, fall, and a winter one as well. In addition to our quarterly symposium, when you entered into this facility, you did see the Emmanuel Nine Memorial. We are, uh, that's a work in prog progress and it will be completed very soon. It will look very differently than what it, how it looks right now, but we will be having an opening so that we can recognize and pay homage to the Emanuel Nine. Uh, and we do thank Boeing for having that, that idea and purpose to celebrate, to pay tribute to them, uh, along with our president, Dr. McNeely, it was just a, a combination of minds getting together and understanding how important it is uh, that we work together, live together, collaborate with one another, and get along with one another civilly. The Institute also offers four courses right now uh, that we make these courses available to business industry. Uh, we offer a course on the philosophy of language. We offer a course on diversity, equity, and inclusion. A third course is on examining facts and fiction. And the fourth course that we're offering right now is the art of listening. And so those are courses that we make available to the community, to our business partners. And if you haven't signed up and participated yet, we're asking you to do so. Now the time and the moment you've been waiting for. It is my pleasure to introduce and present to you our moderator for today's symposium. As Ms. Carter says, he is a native South Carolinian. Yes, he is a native son. 
He is no stranger to uh, South Carolina, Columbia. He does serve as the vice president uh, for ethics with the Boeing Company. He is a two-time graduate of the University of South Carolina. My understanding that he was student body president. He also became president of the Alumni Association, being the youngest person to hold that position and the first person of color to do so. He is a family man. He's an attorney by trade. But we are so delighted that he is a part of the Boeing Allen family. He will serve as our moderator this morning. He's none other than Tommy Preston Jr. I ask that he would come up at this time to uh, do what he has already been asked to do, Mr. Preston. I want to just uh, thank uh, Dr. Evans for, uh, uh, for leading this program today and, and for your leadership. Uh, being a South Carolinian, uh, I've been familiar with uh, all the work you've done for higher education across South Carolina. So I was uh, excited when I heard the announcement that you were coming uh, to Allen to, to lead uh, this, uh, this center. Uh, you know, Dr. McNeely, I'll uh, remember very vividly um, the day that uh, Boeing leaders came up here uh, to meet with you about this concept. And we were sitting in your conference room and you shared the idea with us, not just to have a facility and, and bring this historic building back to life, uh, but also uh, to use this space and to use the work of Allen University to bring people together. And it's uh, truly an honor and even an emotional moment uh, for me to be back here on this campus to see it finally come to fruition. And I know that this is just one of the many events that have taken place already um, that are bringing people together in this uh, community. Uh, you know, at Boeing, part of my job as uh, Vice President of uh, Ethics uh, is to ensure that we have a respectful and inclusive culture. Uh, in our company. And as uh, Sherry said, we have 170,000 employees all over the world. And one of the greatest joys for me as, a, as I like to say, a country boy from South Carolina is traveling around the world and seeing our Boeing employees and the pride that they have in our company, um, the pride that they have in, in the mission of the Boeing company, as Sherry said, to protect and connect and explore our world and beyond. Uh, but one of the things I see often uh, when I travel around our, our factories and offices here in the United States and abroad is our company has become a reprieve uh, in some ways from uh, what you see out in the world, um, the challenges that you see out in the world with, uh, with wars and conflict and political uh, challenges. Um, being in the Boeing Company and working on some of our amazing products and services uh, gives people an opportunity to realize that, that what we do matters and what we do is making a, a difference uh, in the world. And in some ways, that's exactly what the center has the ability to do. It has the ability to bring people to a safe place um, to talk about issues, to learn from each other, to learn specifically about our differences and to chart a, a more positive um, course for a course forward. Um, I particularly want to uh, uh, give a shout out to our, our teammates uh, in North Charleston. Uh, you know, those leaders uh, every day, uh, South Carolinians who are building the beautiful 787 Dreamliners, 70% um, of those are which are going to customers outside the United States. And, and our teammates here in South Carolina truly believe that they have an obligation and an opportunity to connect people around the world. And uh, in some ways, um, the work that they're doing there is so uh, connected to the work that I know this uh, center is going to be doing uh, in, in the years uh, ahead. Um, so, you know, last thing I'll say about this center before I introduce our uh, amazing um, uh, panelists is uh, I truly believe that this uh, space is going to be foundational, not only in improving uh, the state of South Carolina, uh, Columbia, um, but our country and the world, and, and I can only imagine uh, all of the sessions 
uh, and programs we'll be able to have here in the years to come uh, that are gonna uh, truly help make our, our country better. Um, and then I, I, I'm gonna embarrass her for just a moment. I saw Ms. Lindsay Leonard um, walk in, who's our senior leader for national strategy and engagement. In that first meeting, we were talking about uh, the Boeing Center. Lindsay was part of uh, that meeting. And not only uh, did she embrace the concept, but really put her heart and soul into helping perfect uh, the center and, uh, and create something that, that's really special. So uh, just really honored that, that Lindsay is, is here as well. So let's give her a hand. All right, so this is a, a, about me, and I uh, apologize for digressing for a bit to uh, share some thoughts, but I, I really want to introduce uh, our, uh, our panelists today. And I, I want to make a comment about uh, Sherry uh, as I'm introducing our, our two panelists. Uh, one of the things that the Boeing Company has done over the last few years under her leadership is to invest more in uh, African-American museums uh, and facilities uh, across the United States. And, and the Boeing Company, under her leadership, truly believes in the power of learning about civil rights, learning about African American history. So our, our two uh, uh, panelists today uh, embody that uh, uh, so much here in, in the United States. So first, uh, and I'll ask for you to hold the applause for just a moment, but I first want to introduce um, Ms. Della Britton. Um, Della has been the president and CEO of the Jackie Robinson Foundation uh, since 2004. And the foundation works to promote education and the values embodied in the life and legacy of sports and civil rights icon, Jackie Robinson. Uh, in her 20 years with the organization, Della has contributed uh, so much to the growth of this, uh, this organization by expanding and, and diversifying uh, uh, Jackie Robinson's uh, uh, foundation's uh, funding base and program offerings, uh, growing its endowment, uh, establishing a research arm, uh, and spearheading a partnership with Major League um, Baseball. Uh, I should also note that she's also a recovering attorney uh, as well. Um, under uh, Della's leadership, the foundation also opened the Jackie Robinson Museum uh, in New York in, in 2022. Um, before uh, Della came to the foundation, uh, she worked uh, in the in, uh, entertainment industry as an attorney and a, an executive, and she's been a great contributor to community service as well. So we're really honored to have Della here with us. Uh, and then uh, secondly, we have um, Dr. Uh, Russell uh, Wigginton, who has served as the president of the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee since uh, 2021. Uh, he brings to the museum vast experience in education, fundraising, operations, and, and community engagement. Uh, Russ has deep roots in Memphis, uh, in the Memphis community, having worked at Rhodes College, his alma mater, uh, where he was also a scholar, uh, history professor, and senior level administrator uh, for over 23 years. Uh, in, in addition to that, in 2019, uh, he joined Tennessee State Collaborative on reforming education, SCORE, as its chief post-secondary uh, impact officer. And at that organization, he led the organization's work for post-secondary access, uh, retention and completion while seeking opportunities and identifying gaps in advocacy, policy, and practice. So we're glad to have you with us too, Russ. So we'll ask the two of you to come join me on stage and we'll get our conversation started. Della's in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> the rose between two thorns, right? You better believe it. <laughs> well, thank you both for, for being here and uh, just excited about um, this conversation. And we have a lot of ground to cover um, over the next uh, 45 minutes. So uh, I know one of my colleagues is uh, sitting over here to, to my left and will we'll keep us uh, in order here. But, uh, you know, before we uh, begin, uh, just so that we can level set a bit uh, about the work that you all do. So you're both leading prominent uh, museums, uh, you know, Russ obviously in, in Memphis and, and Della in, in New York. Uh, maybe just take a moment to give us a sort of 30,000 foot overview of the National Civil Rights Museum, but also the, the Jackie Robinson Museum. So maybe Della, we'll start with you first. 
Okay, sure. Um, Thirty thousand dollar view. What? Thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand foot view. Well, twenty thousand square feet make up the Jackson Robinson uh, Museum. You know, when I started at the foundation, I came in as a um, to lead the at that point. 30-year-old scholarship program, college scholarship program, and at a meeting shortly after I came on board, the executive committee meeting with the board, Rachel Robinson turned to me and said, you know, I really want a museum. And I said, wow, I, I don't know nothing about birth and no babies, but <laughs> I'm gonna learn <laughs> quickly because when Rachel Robinson speaks, one listens. She was the vision behind the Jackie Robinson Foundation, um, realizing that it took more than money to get uh, the disenfranchised populations of our community um, success into college and, and to become successful. And she, she knew that it took a, a healthy amount of uh, mentoring, a healthy amount of strategies for how to succeed, not only getting through college, but to find a career path. So 50 years later, the Jackie Robinson Foundation thrives as a college scholarship program. But when she said she wanted a museum, I thought, I'm gonna take this woman seriously and I'm gonna figure out how to do this. And with the help of a, a gentleman named Lonnie Bunch, um, who um, some of you may know is the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. He was the inaugural director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. He's been a friend for many years and he really was my guru through this process. So the museum is um, located in New York City uh, at the intersection of Soho and Tribeca downtown, and it is um, credited with being the first cultural institution um, after the Freedom Tower was built um, that addresses uh, issues that are difficult, and that's how some of the media puts it. But interestingly, um, it is not the Taj Mahal. It is modest by size, but it is a has become very quickly a meeting place, a gathering place, and I believe we are kindred spirits with Allen a university because it is our mission to take on the issue of, and with Bowen's help as well on our part, um, to take on um, some of these difficult issues, to address them um, in a safe space, as you, as you, as you mentioned, but it's also um, a place to provide pride, not just for black Americans, but for all Americans. Jackie Robinson was a true humanitarian. Um, the, the collection is 4,500 artifacts strong. We are fortunate to have that based primarily on the Robinson family. Um, but it is also um, a state-of-the-art, dynamic, um, digitized in every sense of the word, um, in every part of our collection. Um, and and it, is, it is a, it is a uh, it, it's not only leading edge in terms of technology, but the, um, the staff, the board um, first class, and, and, and we are also fortunate, as I, as I mentioned earlier, to have Rachel Robinson um, still in our fold. She is 101 years old. She attends most of the board meetings. Um, Content-wise, and I think the thing that I'm most proud about with this museum is the depth of its content. We have 16 media screens um, throughout the museum, um, in addition to an incredible, we call it our scoreboard, an incredible, um, um, exhibit long um, um, screen, and, and, and somebody was telling me about what's happening with the Obama uh, um, Museum and, and, and outfit in Chicago. And apparently it's a 100 foot ceiling, uh, 100 foot uh, a tall screen. Ours is not that quite that big, but thanks to Boeing, we have a very dynamic um, exhibit long, um, almost a block long screen, um, um, in the museum that is interactive with the rest of the exhibition. So that said, um, yes, I'm most proud of the depth of the content, but I'm also very, very proud of the fact that we had tremendous input. I didn't know you at the time, I wish I had, but we've had some incredible advisors on the content. And um, when you're in New York City and Soho, let me stop there and I'm sure we'll come up a little bit um, later some of the other aspects of the museum, particularly our programmatic game. So, that's the Jackie Robinson Museum. That's perfect. Thank sure. you, Doug. Russ, how about you? Well, we're both friends of Lonnie Bunch. Yeah. He is a dear friend to the National Civil Rights Museum and a great, great resource. A week from Thursday, we will have a commemorative event on the courtyard at the National Civil Rights Museum. And at that event, I will have the honor, uh, and I can share with you all, uh, with Martin King III, 
a, an event we do every year, which is change out the wreath. There's a wreath that hangs below room 306. So April 4th is an important day for us. April 4th is an important day for this country and for this world because we get an opportunity to, to remember one of the most important and transformative leaders uh, this country has ever known. We also get an opportunity to be reminded of where we come from at the National Civil Rights Museum. It is the oldest civil rights museum in the country, founded in 1991, but I think it's always important to remind people that for 20 years after Dr. King was assassinated on that very spot, the Lorraine Motel lay in disrepair. It was a place of ill repute. It got people's attention when it was going to be cleared and a, and a parking lot was going to be on that spot. Mm -hmm. That's when people woke up, but for 20 years, it was in an invisible spot. People didn't want to think about what happened there, and they didn't want to think about uh, what it could be. So I'm always quick to tell people that in 1991, when the museum opened, if you go uh, look at the announcement, it was very respectful and nice. But nobody predicted that in 2024, we would have approximately 300,000 visitors annually and 40,000 of those visitors come from outside of the United States. And that the breakdown within the United States would be the majority of people come from outside of a 200 mile radius of Memphis. And that the racial, ethnic, religious, gender, et cetera, uh, uh, disbursement would be uh, what it is. And I also don't think anybody would have predicted that we would be the place where important, uncomfortable conversations are had. Civil and human rights and social justice work is hard. When we think about Dr. Martin Luther King now, we think about, I have a dream speech, and it makes people feel good on the date of his birth. What we don't think about is at the time of his death, it was a 72% disapproval rating in the Gallup poll survey because he was talking about poor people coming together and he was talking about the ills of war. So we are the place that implores our society to step into our nation's past, to be reminded of a, a shared history, and then how do we utilize, learn from, be inspired by that history to be our best selves today? And how do we do that across all of the uh, respective uh, differences that I described already and do it through the lens of humanity and civility? I too feel an alignment with this important uh, mission of, of Allen University and this particular uh, Institute of Civility because at the end of the day, every single day at the National Civil Rights Museum when we open our doors, uh, it's rooted in the legacy of Dr. King. It's focused on love and nonviolence and how do we reach our full potential individually and collectively. Yeah, we have a lot of archives, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not digitized yet, <laughs> so we ain't that fancy. <laughs> but we're trying to get fancy on the digitization front. But at the end of the day, when you walk on that courtyard and you look up at that, at that wreath that's going to be changed out next Thursday, you get reminded that at the end of the day, a couple things Dr. King said. All work, all labor has dignity, and love conquers all. And that's what we talk about and think about and build all of our programming and purpose around at the National Civil Rights Museum. Thank you both. Uh, you know, as you both mentioned, uh, uh, Lonnie Bunch, Sherry and I were just with him on, on Saturday, <coughs> and we were telling him oh, about yeah. this event. Mm -hmm. He said he wished he could be here as well, but 
we were uh, talking about, uh, and Russ, your comments resonate with me in, in, in saying this, he, he was talking about the importance of African-American museums in our country, and he said that they were cultural anchors uh, and, and really an opportunity to leverage the history to prepare us for, for the future. Uh, so I, I want to sort of transition a bit to uh, talk about um, two people you two spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, Dr. King and, and Jackie Robinson, and uh, some of you may not uh, know that they were very close, uh, and they considered themselves uh, close friends uh, and allies. Uh, in fact, when Dr. King was given the uh, I Have a Dream speech uh, in Washington, D.C., Jackie Robinson with his children were you know, right off to the side. Uh, and then there's this great quote from Dr. King uh, in, in talking about Jackie Robinson, and he said that he was a, a pilgrim that walked in the lonesome byways toward the high road of freedom. He was a sit in before sit-ins, a freedom rider before freedom rides. Uh, so maybe before we start getting into civics and ethics and those topics, just uh, because we have the two of you here today, maybe share a little bit about the relationship between uh, Dr. King and, and Jackie and, and, you know, how their partnership and, uh, and connection, you know, really helped to shape the civil rights movement. So Della, maybe yeah, we can Yeah, you. you know, it was a deep relationship. And, and in fact, I don't think many people know um, how close they were, uh, 10 years apart in age, Jackie being the elder, of course, um, and both committed to civil rights. Uh, they first met in 1957, when uh, each was involved in, with the National uh, Council on Christians and Jews. Uh, later that year, when Jackie retired from, from Major League Baseball, he was quick to latch on to the issues and the activities that Dr. King was engaged in. And they met again when they were both given um, honorary degrees by Howard University School of Law, of all places, um, neither being lawyers. But um, they went on to connect. Jackie spent the next, I'd say, decade, um, and, and literally from 57 through uh, Martin Luther King's death and beyond, uh, Jackie spent a lot of time in the South. Um, everything from, gosh, her first event was in 1958, um, when Jackie went down to um, um, uh, later South Carolina, but first went down to um, uh, Birmingham uh, before, before actually the, uh, the uh, burning of the churches uh, to advocate for desegregation. Um, then they worked again in 62 for, with the uh, children's, it was a children's march, march on um, 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 integration of schools. They, they worked again together. Uh, Jackie in 63 um, hosted, he and Rachel hosted a jazz concert at their home in Stamford, Connecticut to benefit those who had been jailed, um, to pay, to actually pay the bail money for Dr. King, um, Abernathy and others who, who had, who had uh, been jailed, um, as we all know, in Birmingham, the famous uh, Birmingham uh, letter from Birmingham jail. Um, Jackie was there, he went down, he knew that his presence as a celebrity um, would make a difference. Um, uh, throughout the 60s, they, they worked together. And I do want to comment on the issue regarding their um, not agreeing on every, in fact, um, Cherry mentioned it and, and, and you mentioned it as well and implied it, which is, um, they did not agree on everything, particularly on one of the most important events of the 60s, which was the Vietnam War. Jackie's view was, um, Commander-in-Chief says you go to war, we go to war to protect democracy. Um, he was a peaceful man, he was a humanitarian from the inside out, but um, they, what I love about their relationship was, um, and, and I think you even mentioned uh, at some point the, the letter writing that went back and forth, uh, between them, maybe it was in your notes, um, um, uh, Tom, but, but it was more than that. They not only exchanged letters, they started each letter with, um, I respect, brother, what you're doing for the community, um, but I wanna give you my viewpoint. And they, they developed over the years such a tremendous mutual respect for each other because they sat down and had that dialogue, because they didn't let the press make it into something uh, that it wasn't. They just disagreed on that issue. They disagreed on a couple of other issues too. Um, Jackie thought there should be more alignment among the various uh, um, movements, everything from Malcolm X's uh, movement to 
um, um, what was happening in, in the mainstream political sphere. Um, but they always talked to each other and they would get together when, when you know, their paths crossed. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because when you talk about character, and I think that's at the base of any discussion on civility. Um, you know, people with the right character, people with the right heart, um, people who speak from the heart, like Cherry, I always love when Cherry speaks because she, you know, she follows what her team tells her, but she always goes to that place where um, she reaches deep and says, this is how, this is how, it, how I feel about it. This is how it really is um, without the fancy words that, um, that uh, your very, very accomplished staff puts together. And, and these two had that. Um, I want to quote, you quoted what, what King said about um, Jackie. I want to quote what Jackie said about King, devastated by his assassination. Um, um, Jackie, in 1968, Jackie said, um, this was one of the most important leaders of our century um, and beyond. Uh, he was very, very upset and touched by, by Dr. King's death. And um, um, one other sort of pop culture, since we always have to inject pop culture, at least that's what I've learned in this museum context, that you know, always have to have the celebrities and the culture. Um, uh, Dr. King appeared just literally months before he died on the Larry King Show. Um, I don't know if some of you in the audience are too young to remember Larry King's show, but it was a, an iconic variety show. And um, uh, King was about to, Larry King was about to interview Dr. Martin Luther King and before he came on, he said, uh, introduced him as the founder of the Civil Rights Movement. Hmm. And when, when Martin got on stage, you know, and, 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 and began his uh, question, at the end of his sort of, you know, dialogue with uh, Larry King, um, Dr. King said, I want to correct something you said. He said, I was not the founder um, of the Civil Rights Movement. Jackie Robinson was the founder of the Civil Rights Movement because what he did, um, really allowed us to do our to do our job. Gave us paved the way to set in a prof sort of profound way um, that we all belong at the table at every table in this country, and and so there was just such a strong mutual respect. And I could go on about you know some of the interactions they had, but um, um, and Dr. King is, is featured prominently in the museum, so you got to come up and and uh, and talk about it with me at the museum. I hope. Uh I, I think what I'm hearing is uh, in, in, in our rotating exhibit gallery at the National Civil Rights Museum, uh, our sports and civil rights series that uh, Jackie Robinson will be featured at. This is what we do in the museum world. We figure out how to work together. <laughs> I, I would just real quickly add to that, uh, uh, I mean, and Della just did a beautiful job of, of talking about the personal dimensions. Um, they both worked in lonely spaces. The work that they did, there weren't a lot of people that they could have free and open dialogue with and there would be mutual understanding. I think that's important. I think it's important when, when you uh, connect it back to what it means to be in leadership roles uh, and the power and importance of civility. When, when you, for example, may be leading uh, in spaces where there are, there's antagonistic relationship and you have to be in a room or in space with someone who you're supposed to not like. Those are lonely spaces. And they figured out how to navigate those spaces. Not just, I mean, they obviously developed a wonderful relationship, but, uh, but, but the, the list is pretty short of who you can who you can have honest and true dialogue with people and they understand from uh, the position that you're in. Uh, that, this notion of empathy and sensing the humanity in someone else is so critical when you talk about how do we uh, move forward and get along whether we agree or disagree. We know that ultimately that always is going to be at play but it doesn't have to be front and center all the time. If you get to the place of humanity, I think it gives you a chance to uh, find viable solutions. And while they had a friendship, they modeled that in a beautiful way that I think uh, we could still learn from today. Della, I'm so glad you, you hit the Vietnam uh, topic because I, I think that is one of the sort of quintessential areas where the two of them disagree with each other that sort of 
manifested in, in the media mm -hmm. and, and press. Mm -hmm. um, but taking them out a, a little bit, I mean, there's no question that as we think about civility, the civil rights uh, movement just generally provided a great lesson for how we as people who have disagreements should engage. I mean, whether it's you know violence versus nonviolence, or mm -hmm. you know thinking about the tactics that were used in the South versus other places, maybe share your your perspective on. You know, what are some of the lessons that we could learn or we should have learned from the civil rights movement uh, and apply it to what we see in the discourse today? Yeah, you know, when you, you talk about hard places and sacrifices, um, um, I, I, I think sort of the ultimate sacrifice was, um, and this, you know, obviously we can go back to Gandhi, we can go back to other people whom Dr. Martin Luther King studied with, but the sheer sort of brazenness of refusing to cave to physical force, mm. um, you know, that in of itself is, is, is very active sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, brazen uh, stance. I and mean, the fact that you can sit there at a lunch counter and have, uh, you know, be, be prodded and, and, and have uh, food poured over you and, 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 and liquids poured over you, and not budge and, and stand your ground. That's powerful stuff. Um, when we think of today, the smallest thing ignites um, physical conflict. The smallest, I mean, a name calling. A, a, and, and, and I don't, I, you know, I wanna be careful not to sort of then now. I, I happen to believe that you know, people don't change a whole lot, but I think the element of it, it, meaning, meaning, you know, it, it, things go around, they come around, I'm not so sure. Um, technology is a big force, so I'm not sure I won't change this perspective when it comes to um, um, some hindsight reflection on technology. But people, you know, are generally people. We are cut from a cloth that that, um, that God made and, and, and that we sustain, have sustained. Um, but I do think it's leaders. I think it's, and you know, charisma is a word that comes to mind, but it's the courageous leaders like a Dr. King, like Jackie Robinson, who um, make the difference. So I think you know, people tend to act a certain way, but when you inject into that situation a powerful personality, that's the only way I can do it, a powerful character. I, I often say about Jackie, he, he has an unassailable character. As hard as they tried to find him, you know, in, in some compromising situation, you know, some, some scandal, some, you know, he had the benefit of being madly in love with his wife, who is a, a lovable, beautiful, um, incredible role model as a woman. Um, few know that Rachel Robinson, as an aside, uh, graduated from UCLA with a degree in, in psychiatric uh, degree in nursing, and went on to get a master's degree from NYU in psychiatric nursing. A lot of people don't know that about Rachel. Contrasted with the fact that Jackie dropped out of UCLA the spring semester of his senior year to go and and get a job to help his mother and his four siblings um, at home. He was the you know leader, the sort of you know he was also the the patriarch, if you will, of his family, although he was the youngest child. There's something special about him. So, so my point is, you know, it, it, it's, it's these leaders that I think, for me, um, may have a different perspective, make the difference. That, that what can we learn from the civil rights movement? Let's just find the leaders of today who have the courage, who have the um, sense of values that allow them. You know, one quick example I'll give, and I, you know, I try to give examples in these contexts of, of um, that people don't know. Um, people think they know a lot about Jackie. One of the things we're proud of with the museum is you literally have to walk through the other iterations of Jackie's life. You have to walk through his career in the military. You have to walk through his civic engagement in mainstream politics when he was an advisor to Governor Rockefeller, when he supported Nixon in, the, in 1960 instead of Kennedy, having met with both men and concluding that Nixon uh, said the right things and was more um, apt to latch on to progress on the civil rights front then Kennedy, Kennedy, one of the things Jackie said is Kennedy didn't look him straight in the eye. He said, and, and when I asked him what he thought about, you know, the Negro movement, as it was called then, um, Kennedy said, I don't think we're quite ready to address some of those issues right now. Um, and that turned, that turned off Jackie. Fast forward, Jackie did regret um, supporting Nixon when he got the full, full measure of his character. But, but, but one of the things that I think uh, people don't realize a lot, um, uh, people don't know about Jackie, literally, is 
um, that when he was involved in, in, in politics, he was always seeking a basis of the truth. He always would say, look you in the eye and say, just give me the facts first, and then we'll talk about where we stand on those facts. And so another element, aside from leadership being, I think, an important lesson um, in how to change the world for the better, how to increase civility, um, um, besides you know, finding great heroes who've helped do that, is um, starting with the facts. I fantasize about programs at the Jackie Robinson Museum where the program starts with a PowerPoint because we live on PowerPoints mm -hmm. these days, but it starts with a PowerPoint of facts. So if you're gonna have a discussion about something, let's start with, okay, how many people voted in that area? And who won this election? And how did they win this election if that's the conversation? If the conversation is about um, um, affirmative action, let's start with, what are the facts on that, on that front? Um, you know, how many, what happened when uh, colleges and universities, PWIs, predominantly white institutions, opened up to African Americans? What does that look like? After Derek Bach, the president of Harvard, and, and Bill Bowen, the president of Princeton, um, wrote a book some you know, 25 years after um, um, affirmative action was eaten away at, that affirmative action was instilled, and I, I, I don't mind the term affirmative action, but, but, but I, I know it has a taint that, that others are, are, are offended by, but I was an affirmative action baby, affirmative action college student, um, admitted to um, 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 a university in 1971 where we were the second class of women and one of the first classes of anybody of color. And, and, but I, but, but, but I, when they wrote a book, when Derek Bach and William Bowen wrote a book about affirmative action having worked, that's not part of the dialogue when we talk about these Supreme Court cases that are coming up. We need to talk about the facts and the statistics on how effective affirmative action was um, as a policy. Not perfect, and I don't know any policy, you know, in my limited view and in limited experience in, in, in government, I don't know any policy that's flawless. And certainly affirmative action wasn't. But it made a difference. Otherwise, we would not be where we are now. Um, you know, reparations we can talk about, but we would not have um, a room that looked like this today if it were not for, for affirmative action. I know I'm speaking to the choir because I'm speaking in, you know, in, in front of people who are in, in higher education. But, so I think two elements for me, and I'll just throw that out, is, is, is leadership. I, I, I think it depends on progress and civility, depends on um, leadership. Um, leaders who don't come along very often, and I think secondly, it depends on starting any dialogue around any controversial issue with the facts. Just, you know, it, it, it don't get complicated, but the basic facts, and I think that would make a difference um, among people of goodwill who yeah. really want to have these conversations. Sorry to go on about no, that, but I've thought a lot fact. about this yeah, thank you. way before uh, uh, I was asked to come today. Sure. So I'll offer a, a little bit of a different twist uh, as it relates to um, uh, thinking about leadership and leaders. One of the things we do at the National Civil Rights Museum is we spend a lot of time lifting up and highlighting uh, what, I, what, what we tend to think of as ordinary people who do extraordinary things. Now, we do have iconic uh, historically more recognized civil rights leaders, uh, if you will, throughout the museum. But our, our sort of bread and butter is lifting up ordinary people who do extraordinary things. At the same time, some of those people who have been identified as extraordinary, we often uh, offer different dimensions of those folks. And I'll use Rosa Parks, for example. Uh, one of the things, one of my favorite things to do is when I get a chance to spend time actually in the museum uh, and watching people uh, see uh, the, a bus from the same fleet that Rosa Parks sit on and that bronze statue of her on that bus in that very seat, people of all ages, backgrounds, et cetera, who witness that. And having one of our tour guides ask the question, who knows that Rosa Parks and her story? Everybody's hand goes up. Everybody gets excited. And then they tell the story. And it's a nice story. It's a nice wrapped up in the bow kind of story that kind of ends something like, and they lived happily ever after. And then we have the opportunity to say more about this 
fascinating woman, Rosa Parks, who did not just get tired one day. So it makes for a great story. But to me, it's so much more powerful when you know this quiet warrior went to the Highlander School, was the secretary of the NAACP in Montgomery, was not the first choice. You all know this, but not everybody does. Was not the first choice. There was strategy behind the movement, right? And so I don't, I like when people have a way to remember people like Rosa Parks. But I think there's more there if we know the nuance, not just of her, but people who we also don't know. When you find out these things, it actually, I believe, allows all of us, children in particular, to see themselves in some other shoes. They don't have to be remarkable to do Rosa Parks like. They can just be principled and be learning and be civil and make a difference. That is a part of what we have to do. Della, Della used the, the, the wonderful phrase of, how about the facts, right? Part of what I'm talking about is setting the stage so that when the facts enter the equation, they don't get overlooked or dismissed. So it's, and you don't have a lot of time to present the facts. So your ability to level set for a conversation or an understanding or a, um, um, a dialogue is so critically important. I feel like uh, the, the seminar that was mentioned earlier on listening uh, that ought to be required uh, uh, here and everywhere else because it's actually a novel concept and we don't do enough of it. None of us do. And the idea of listening just brought my heart joy because when you do that, it's actually empowering to listen to somebody. And we just can't, we can't do it. We got to hurry up and get to, to what we have to say. The idea of listening grounds us in a, a, a respectful place that sets us up, if you will, to allow something special to happen after you listen. Russ, as you were uh, giving that explanation, I, I, I was imagining being in one of your classes at Rhodes uh, College. <laughs> um, and I'm going to ask a question. We have a number of students uh, in the room today, uh, Allen students. and. I know other students will be watching this at other points in, in the future. Uh, you know, growing up here in South Carolina, uh, and I shared this with you earlier, uh, you know, we had a, uh, a cadence of sending University of South Carolina students on pilgrimages uh, through the civil rights locations, and we spent mm -hmm. time in, in your museums, and truly one of the most transformative experiences in my life. And, Della, just thinking about even growing up in the northern part of the state, the upstate, uh, where Jackie Robinson visited at one point in his mm -hmm. career, and, and we learned about his visit because it was so important in South Carolina uh, during that time. I'd just be interested just in talking to the students for just a moment. What advice would you give them on the, on the obligation or responsibility that they have to you know, continue the work in civility and justice in, in our in our country. And, and students in the audience, I hope you'll pay very close attention uh, to what they have to say here. You know, I'd answer first by, by being an advocate. Um, one of Jackie's favorite, one of his, his mantras in life was, the ballot and the buck are what are gonna make the difference in, in um, marginalized communities, um, particularly, of course, for him, the black community. And, and he lived that. He was not only engaged in civil rights struggles, but he's very much engaged um, in mainstream politics. You've got to vote. You've got to, we have to push for the vote places where they're not. This gerrymandering uh, project that Eric Holder, former Attorney General of the United States, has, has championed, um, has highlighted a lot of uh, what's happening in sort of modern day uh, context of um, voter, um, um, 
registry, voting registration and voter restriction. Um, you know, there's subtle ways it's done now, as is the case with, with, with all forms of, of oppression. Um, so, so the ballot in the buck for him meant be involved in civic activities. We have to, you know, this is, this is a system we're, we're with, and, 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 and I'm one who believes that it's the best system around the world. Um, um, but, but, but make sure you stay involved. So what does it mean to say vote? It not only means you personally vote, it means you get others out to vote. It means you advocate for voting. It means you pay attention to issues on ballots that have to do with voter um, um, restriction and registration. Um, and then the buck. Um, financial literacy is a big aspect of the program we do with our Jackie Robinson College Scholars. Um, it is a, we actually got a grant, not as big as our Boeing grant, <laughs> um, um, but we got a nice grant to do a financial literacy program at the museum and, and we've architected that. And, and the whole point there, listen, you know, we are responsive to the entire community, but we are particularly focused on making sure that um, people of color, black people specifically, um, um, who are so easily identifiable at the polls, if you will, um, vote and get involved in voting and are protected and their vote is, is protected. Um, but the financial literacy piece is so critical um, because we're a capitalistic society. I uh, don't want to debate that today and what that means and whether we should be as capitalistic as we are. But the truth is, um, you know, economic empowerment was critical. And, and, and Jackie, um, is the, it was his brainchild to open um, the Harlem, uh, uh, the Freedom National Bank in Harlem uh, in New York City because the black community was not getting um, access to small business loans or big business loans for that, that matter, or mortgages. And so while he wasn't a banker, he wasn't a finance expert, he, he, he used his advocacy again to put together um, a group of financiers and investors to start, um, it wasn't the first black bank, um, and, and, but it was the largest at the time. The second um, um, sort of front that I think young people today should pay attention to is, um, is again, this notion of you know, dialogue. I'll, get, I'll draw on part of our curriculum with our Jackie Robinson Foundation Scholars, which is um, get to know people on your campuses. If you're on a PWI and not, don't have the luxury of being at a, on a campus like Allen University where um, you, you really do have the support, you don't have that extra element of feeling like you don't belong um, as a person given your background, your pedigree, however you describe it. Um, but if you are in environments um, um, that are uh, you know, multicultural, um, even multinational, um, in this country, get to know each other. I mean, it is your responsibility as leaders to take that step, to make sure not only that you get to know other people for your own sort of personal arsenal, but so that you show the rest of the world that you are, that you belong at the table, that you, that you are as smart and bright and, 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 and ambitious as, as you all are. So, you know, I would, I would draw on that ballot in the buck um, philosophy of Jackie's and say, be active in your communities, um, um, certainly from a, a, a voting political standpoint, but also um, the financial literacy is, is, is crucial because financial security is what gives you the um, strength and the platform to, to make change. It's as simple Perfect. as that for Perfect. me, I, you know. Sure, sure, I follow you. So uh, we are in the middle of a transformative renovation at the National Civil Rights Museum, and I'm, I'm proud to say that, uh, that Boeing was an early supporter to give us uh, the momentum, if you will, to capitalize on this opportunity. Uh, we have a component to the museum called the Legacy Building, which is where the shot was fired from that killed Dr. King, so it's across the street from the Lorraine Motel, and we have a, a park uh, that's there as well. That renovation is very much around thinking about uh, the youth and young people of today. Right now, when you visit the National Civil Rights Museum, the last component is a visit to room 306. And so many people ask, what happened to the movement after Dr. King died? This renovation will help answer that question. Number one, the, the, uh, the, the movement 
did not end. Uh, the movement continued. It was rooted in a lot of the things that we talk about in the Lorraine. But this renovation is, comes, the theme of it comes from Dr. King's last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos Our Community. I'll say that one more time for people in the back. Where do we go from here? Chaos Our Community. That book was written in 1967. It could have been written in 2024. And what Dr. King did is lay out these respective pillars that still matter today, poverty, housing, education, criminal justice. We, we inserted gender. That was not a term that was uh, commonly referred to, gender equity, in, in 1967-68. But what we're trying to do is center important issues that stem from the movement that are still relevant today. And the reason it's important to do and talk to and have it be focused on young people and youth today is because every day, someone who, the number of people who remember vividly and participated in the historic civil, right move, civil rights movement, we lose them every day. And in a decade, frankly, there won't be anyone left to get a first-hand account. So all of that history, we will rely on some documentation. You talk about facts. It's really hard to have a fact-based conversation when no one in the room was actually there or living or remembers it. So, you, so we have to do this now. And we have to have young people engage and care about and see the value of and the principles of that era and how do they apply today? So this entire renovation project is about 1968 up to the present so that everyone can see the things that happen today as having tentacles or reference back to that era. It is important to recognize that things have manifested over time and are different in so many ways. But you have to see the, the points of entry, if you will, from yesterday in order to fully understand it. And so I told my board, uh, jokingly, but, 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 but not, I need your money for this renovation, but it's not for you. It's for your children and your grandchildren. Because you all remember this stuff. You know where you were standing on April 4, 1968. April 4, 1968 may as well have been 1908 to today's 12-year-old. And we're going to blink and they're going to be, it's going to be a decade and they're going to be graduating from University of South Carolina or Allen uh, or, or pick an institution. And we're going to expect them to have these skills these important skills like civility, respect, listening. It'd be, it'd be nice if you could read and write too. Um, we're going to expect them to do all of these things, but they're not going to have any context. And if they don't have any context, it minimalizes the importance of all those other skills. So we're building context for young people today who don't know anything about the civil rights movement. They know fun facts, and that's not sufficient. So we're, we, have, we know what our charge is for the next decade. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Boeing, uh, as an early supporter, we're well on our way, uh, and it will be a transformative spot for the National Civil Rights Museum, and I think set us up to be relevant in the future uh, um, in a way that that's going to be important for this country. So we're uh, we're almost at time, and uh, I had this image of being at the Apollo Theater and they're jerking us off stage. So I don't want that to happen. <laughs> uh, but I do. Uh, I mean, just powerful words from both of you. And as we conclude today, uh, would love uh, quickly for both of you to share. You know, what is your hope? for the Boeing Institute on Civility here at Allen University. Um, so Della, maybe I'm putting you on the spot here with that. Well, that no, question, I, you know, I, I talk about technology because the, the truth is that the, I, I joke about when 
um, young people walk into the museum, there are all these interactive screens um, that are going on. Again, when you live in New York City, it's all about location, 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 not so much size. Um, and we make wonderful use of, of, of the size of, of the museum. But young people come in and they start going through the screens and they punch this and punch that and they're very much at home. I mean, this big, young people and, and, and bigger. People my age, um, not me because I've been schooled, but people my age come in and they start reading what's on the wall and, <laughs> and they don't even think about the screens. And so, you know, I think technology has provided so many opportunities. The idea that this is being streamed, you know, again, I hate to focus on my age, but you know, when I found out uh, from, from Cherry and the Boeing people that this was gonna be streamed last night, I thought that's incredible. I mean, that, that opens up the, you know, the floodgates to dialogue. And, and so after someone could watch, I don't know if anything I say is particularly important, but someone could watch a program like this and then um, in their classroom have dialogue after. What do you think about what the crazy lady from Jackie Robinson Museum said? What do you think about, um, you know, the guy with the bow tie, you know, however, you know, they're very, vis you know, very visual and very much um, focused on that. But, but this can bring um, the kind of, 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 of dialogue and the, um, again, I still believe that there are, there are heroes who have a way of connecting with people. Um, and so if you can, those heroes can't be everywhere. You talk about, you know, real them. Jackie traveled, one of the reasons he died prematurely at 53 um, um, from complications, a heart attack and, and diabetes was he really did not stop um, one day of his life from being committed to this, uh, 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 to, to civil rights and to um, um, equitable, equitable um, um, opportunities. And, and you know, I, I was gonna mention something about um, how when Jackie's son became addicted to, to drugs, to strong drugs like heroin when he was in the military, um, Jackie then, and remember this is, in, this is back 1960s, Jackie then went on a crusade with his son around the country to talk about um, drug addiction among young people. You know, everyone else in that sort of of that ilk and that sort of strand of society would have swept it under the rug and not wanted anybody to know. And he went to a rehabilitation center. And, but Jackie said, no, we need to talk about this issue. It's an important issue. People like that with the courage again and the, and the, and the, um, um, the will to, to address tough issues and to teach from a, a position of real sort of honesty um, can be heard. And so I would say, um, let's do this, you know, let's do this technologically. Let's have a dialogue between Allen University and, and, and some of our universities in New York City, um, even if we do it electronically. This generation is comfortable with that. I mean, I can't, do you remember when we used to have calls, conference calls were rare. You know, conference calls where, where you, you know, more than three or four people got on a call. Certainly, I remember Skyping, I think it was the first iteration of, of, you know, talking to each other on the phone. Now, every call is, is you know, on a screen. And I thought, well, do we really, I know what you look like, you know what I look like, can we just, you know, can we just talk on the phone? No, 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 you have to, because I do think you, 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 you capture a conversation better when you see someone's body language, yeah. when they're able to express themselves. People like me who talk with their hands. I mean, it's a very, very important medium. Um, and in general, technology, you know, AI, don't even start with, you know, what that can do and, and what challenges that brings um, in terms of veracity, in terms of, of open dialogue. So I would say, um, um, you know, take advantage of technology. You're lucky it's a beautiful building, by the way. Congratulations, Allen University. Congratulations, Boeing. Um, and, and, and so, you know, let's, technology strikes me as a, as a key tool and being able to have this kind of dialogue and to share information, to share the truth. Um, uh, that's, that, that would be my, my main message. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Russ. So uh, on the technology front, I'll just say that all of the programming at the National Civil Rights Museum now is hybrid. Uh, so it's it's part of the that it's, sounds fancy. It's, it's it's it is it's pretty <laughs> fancy. It's part of the deal. Um, I would hope for uh, this center uh, to, and, and it's already clear, you can actually literally feel it in this building and in this space, it embody something we care deeply about at the National Civil Rights Museum. And, and that is, people ask me, what do I want people to take from the National Civil Rights Museum? And I, and I could imagine this is what Alan wants people to take from this amazing facility and the, and the work here. 
I want people, I want there to be a collision between your head and your heart. That's what, that's what I want to happen. I want you to read some stuff and touch some buttons and have all of that. Um, but then I want something to uh, hit you here that captures you for whatever reason, perhaps an unrelated reason. Perhaps it reminds you of your grandmother. Perhaps it happened to you. Perhaps you are aspiring to be in a certain space. Whatever the case is, I want you to have that collision. Uh, and and I'm, I'm certain that here in this institute, in this amazing institution, when you know that when those collisions happen, people just don't remember in the moment. They circle back. It pops in their mind. It connects to things that seemingly are unrelated. And so that collision is what we're all looking for, the intellectual and the heartfelt are part of what the magic is, I believe, uh, for all of us. Well said. Well said, absolutely. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, this is it, folks. Uh, you know, just want to thank you both for being here and thank uh, you. this powerful conversation. And uh, Dr. Evans, we'll turn it back over to you. Let me just yeah. say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Preston, for facilitating such an amazing uh, civil discourse on civility, social justice, bridging the past to the present. Uh, and our amazing speakers, Attorney Britton and, and Dr. Wigginton, we are just blessed to have you here and to have shared with us. That's what the Institute is all about, the exchange, the dialogue, the conversation. Uh, there is no I in team. I can't do this by myself. But there are some amazing individuals that work along with me, the Boeing Institute planning team. There's uh, Ms. D.A. Dennis. There's Dr. Robert Hutchinson, Dr. Crystal Graham, uh, Dr. Eric, Dr. Yancey, and of course, Ms. Salters. Uh, they help to pull this together. Thank you all for choosing to be a part of our symposium on today. Thank you, Boeing. Thank you, Boeing, for investing in Allen and this uh, institute. We could not do it without you. Again, we appreciate you for being in our presence today. Have a wonderful day. It is a perfect day to be civil. Thank you. <laughs>